cysts in the synovium. And this results in synovitis as well as uh, proliferation of the synovial cells. There is a lot of enzyme production in these proteases together with the stimulation of the osteoclasts lead to cartilage and bone erosion. So the process of chronic inflammation clinically is seen as a patient with pain who eventually develops joint damage and disability. So how frequent is this condition that I'm talking about? The WHO estimate in 2021 says that up to 14 million people in the whole world has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in contrast, 2021 meta-analysis gives a higher figure of 35 million, which is essentially 0.4% or 460 per 100,000 individuals. In the United States in 2014, they estimated that around 1.36 million adults have rheumatoid arthritis. What about in the Philippines? Uh, these data are a bit uh, old. Uh, the, young, the newest data was 2003. But this show us that among adults, the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis ranges from 0.17 to 0.6%, which translates to, 100, to 200 to 700,000 Filipinos with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, considering that there are 100 million or a bit more Filipinos now, you might think it's not much, no? That's less than a million Filipinos with rheumatoid arthritis. But considering that this is a chronic disease, then I think this is a condition that we need to pay attention to because we want to take care of everyone. Di ba nga walang iwanan? So how do we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? If you look at picture A and B, um, you might say, this look a bit close to normal. But in picture A, we see some swelling of the proximal interphalangeal joints and also the metacarpophalangeal joints or the MCP. The photo in B, also highlights if you look at the pointer the swelling at the at the wrists you might think that oh there's doesn't seem to to be much swelling in the fingers but the swelling is more obvious at the wrists if if we look at the pictures below letter c and d then this might be uh more obvious no when we look at these pictures we think of rheumatoid arthritis given the swan neck and the boutonniere deformity and uh, this, the, the, the swelling, no? the proliferation at the wrists also. So we as much as possible want to catch patients when they are in letter A in that condition because this is relatively early disease. And we hope to prevent them reaching the conditions of patients in C and D. So how do we really recognize rheumatoid arthritis? I think the most important to remember is the inflammatory arthritis. And when we think of the classic description that rheumatoid arthritis is a polyarthritis, which by definition is five or more joints. But look here, it may just be three joints or you have more. Classically, there is symmetrical distribution and the smaller joints like the MCPs and the PIPs are more commonly affected than the large joints. And uh, the wrists are also included among those joints that are commonly affected. And the duration of symptoms is, is supposedly chronic. It's more than six weeks. 
There are elevated acute phase reactants such as CRP or ESR, and there are positive autoantibodies, uh, namely the rheumatoid factor as well as the anti-citrullinated peptide antibody. For many, many years, uh, when I was training and up to the time when I was a relatively younger consultant, all that we had was the rheumatoid factor. But now we already have in the Philippines and even in PGH, the ACPA. So we have more diagnostic tools with us right now. One, one very important thing to remember is that uh, these manifestations of inflammatory arthritis can also be explained by other diseases like psoriatic arthritis. And uh, we know that 30% of patients with psoriatic arthritis can present initially with arthritis without the skin manifestations. And they can present very similar to rheumatoid arthritis. So let's take note of that differential. We must also think of acute viral polyarthritis in the age of COVID. And you know, even hepatitis B is also common in the Philippines. So we must think of this when we encounter a patient with uh, polyarthritis. Polyarticular gout, no, especially if the patient is male or uh, crystal or uh, pyrophosphate dihydrate disease, no, and SLE and erosive osteoarthritis are other differentials. So we must think of other of these diseases before we are able to definitely say that the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. So as a, as a doctor. Uh, we know that we that there is inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. So if you follow the graph at the left side and you look at a span of 30 years of disease from left to right, so that's um, long duration of disease. If you look at the black line, that, that refers to inflammation. So no matter how long the disease has been going on, in a patient who is untreated, we see that inflammation persists. Hindi siya nawawala, hindi siya nagbe-burn out, even if the disease is long-standing. That is, in a patient who is untreated. And uh, this chronic inflammation is um, reflected in the patient as uh, damage in the radiograph. So we see that after 30 years, you have more damage, you have increasing damage, and with the damage goes disability. So we'd like really to be able to diagnose early so that we can treat early, sana within the first three months of disease, and identify patients with poor prognostic indicators so that we can manage them more aggressively and be, you know, more um, forward-looking in these patients. So we establish the prognosis by looking at, you know, it, you may say, oh, this is a long list of prognostic factors. But if we just digest it, it will tell us that this is uncontrolled inflammation. So, and this is manifested by moderate or how high disease activity indices despite treatment with disease modifying drugs. And um, if you have the autoantibodies, the rheumatoid factor and the ACPA, especially if they are present at high levels, then early on we know that this patient has a poor prognosis and we need to be more aggressive, we need to be more alert in watching the patient. In a patient with early erosions, for example, you, you have a patient with onset at six months and when you do an X-ray, you already see the erosions, then that is early erosions. And if you have used two or more disease-modifying drugs, then we know that that is a patient with 
uh, poor prognosis. Buti na lang, uh, we now have uh, more disease-modifying drugs and we classify them as synthetic and as biological disease-modifying drugs. From the name disease-modifying drugs, these help us control inflammation and prevent the joint damage from setting in. We are quite familiar with methotrexate, which is a conventional synthetic DMARD. And uh, worldwide, this is, this is the anchor drug for rheumatoid arthritis. In the Philippines, we also have hydroxychloroquine. We used to have leflunomide and uh, well, sulfasalicin, we don't have that. So we, we're still hoping that these can become available in, in the country. We also now have the targeted synthetic DMARD. So they are also tablets and they work by uh, preventing intracellular signaling so that uh, inflammatory substances cannot be produced. And uh, these targeted synthetic DMARDs are mostly the Janus kinase inhibitors. And we have baricitinib and tocotinib in the country. The biological disease-modifying drugs, these are uh, divided into originator and biosimilar DMARDs. And we have the anti-TNF, the anti-interleukin-6, the co-stimulation molecules, as well as, well as anti-CD20. So many of these are also available in the Philippines. So we have more drugs in our momentarium for our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The only problem is access because the newer drugs are quite expensive given that unlike in cancer we're in there may be a specific period of chemotherapy in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we have to give these drugs really for long periods of time. We also have guidelines to, uh, to show us uh, how to manage rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm just showing you here one of the newer guidelines. This is from Europe. And, you know, the algorithm is complicated, but if you look at the left side of this, the screen or the slide, you will see that it's really a matter of starting with a conventional synthetic DMARD. So mostly that's methotrexate. And you can start that with or without a glucocorticoid. Uh, our favorite here is prednisone. And usually that's at a low dose. So that, that's how we start. And uh, we give the patient three to six months observed during that period where, when we maximize our DMARD monotherapy. And if at the end of six months, they do not achieve our set targets, which is a low disease activity state or remission, then depending on whether they have poor prognostic factors or not, we go on to either combine with another disease-modifying drug, whether that, so that can be conventional synthetic. So in our case, that's usually hydroxychloroquine. But if there is or there are poor prognostic factors, then we go higher with a biologic or a JAK inhibitor. And after six months, if they're not better, then we change to another biologic DMARD or a JAK inhibitor. And, uh, and, and we hope that by the time, then we have controlled the disease. So we monitor improvement in three months, but we usually wait for six months before we go to the next level. Of course, this is a guide. Uh, we can opt to be more aggressive uh, depending on our patient, depending on our um, interaction with the patient. So um, I've been mentioning about poor prognostic factors and treating properly and on time. 
But really, the key is being able to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis early. And in 2010, uh, a new classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis was put forth by uh, jointly by the American College of Rheumatology and the European League of Associations for Rheumatology, uh, essentially primarily because uh, we want an early, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis that is earlier because the ACR 1987 criteria, when you follow these criteria, it looks for radiographic changes, uh, which may occur later. So the ACR ULAR 2010 criteria enables us to classify patients uh, to have rheumatoid arthritis at an earlier period of time. So as an example, if you have uh, involvement of more than 10 joints, and at least one of them is an MCP or a PIP, then that's already five points. And if that symptomatology has been going on for six weeks, then you already have a score of six, which classifies a patient as having rheumatoid arthritis, which gives you um, enough basis to start treatment with methotrexate. So as far as I'm concerned, all physicians should be able to suspect at the minimum and hopefully recognize the manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. And that is one of our objectives in putting forth the Physician's Guide to Telerheumatology, which is really not only a guide for telerheumatology, but is also very useful for the non-rheumatologists, even in face-to-face -face or in-person consultations. Another thing in being able to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis early is also to recognize patients with joint pains who are suspicious for progression to rheumatoid arthritis. If we read publications from the ULAR, we will see such a term as pre-RA. No? So they do not have definite RA yet, but may be in a state that will progress to definite RA. And there are two definitions for this condition, a sensitive definition or a specific definition. And a sensitive definition simply means that you have three or more of the seven items that are listed here from the history and the physical examination. And a specific definition is having four or more out of the seven. And if you have three items present in your patient, that has a sensitivity of 90%, which is pretty good in picking up patient with high probability of progressing to rheumatoid arthritis. So the items in the history are joint symptoms of recent onset, uh, involvement of the metacarpophalangeal joints, uh, morning stiffness, which is prolonged, and that the symptoms are more severe in the morning, as well as a first degree relative with rheumatoid arthritis. And in PE, you look here, it's very simple. Difficulty with making a fist and a positive squeeze test of the metacarpophalangeal joints. So this is a good tool uh, for us to, you know, identify patients with joint pains and see who of these are suspicious for progression to rheumatoid arthritis because you don't stop there. Uh, the ULAR also has recommendations on how to manage these patients with early arthritis. And if you look at, at this algorithm, essentially, you know, the treatment is similar. It's essentially the same as what you do for a patient already with definite rheumatoid arthritis. We use methotrexate, you optimize the dose, 
You may combine it for short term with low dose glucocorticoids. And if the patient cannot tolerate methotrexate or has contraindication, when then we use other disease modifying drugs. We monitor them and see if we're able to achieve remission within six months. And if that's a yes, then we continue with the treatment. And if unable to achieve remission within six months, then we reevaluate. It might be a different disease. We couple this with other, other things in the management like education, administration of NSAIDs, exercises, OT, and other activities for prevention of disease like advising the patient to stop smoking and manage the comorbidities. So our target really is to have a happy patient able to do what he wants in life and avoid uh, the bad state of the patients we have in C and D. And the discovery of treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, I gave you a list of DMARDs earlier, but we see that, uh, well, when I was a, an intern, that was in 1988, uh, when I took the board exam, that was just when methotrexate, um, its use for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis was strongly established. And Earlier on, there were a few drugs which were available in the world, many of them not available in our country, uh, only glucocorticoids and later on hydroxychloroquine. But earlier on, it was chloroquine that we were using, no? Aralen, uh, which was a drug available from the DOH for the treatment of malaria. But we see that from uh, in the Late in 1998, that was when uh, the biologics era started, and the first one to be introduced was etanercept. And in 2013, that was when the first jacinib, tofacitinib, became available. And we are looking forward to uh, other biologic DMARDs, other targeted synthetic DMARDs, as well as other emerging therapies, including stem cell uh, treatment. So these are all being studied now. So with the discovery of drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, there also came the, the establishment of registries. Um, and you see, this is just to show you the registries that were established in uh, Europe. Every country has its own registry. And uh, this was a publication in 2017. And um, the core Evitas is the RA registry in the US. And they claim in their website that it's the largest RA real world prospective cohort study involving 857 plus rheumatologists and more than 56,000 patients. They have participating sites across the US. And, you know, this is something that um, we might want to look into um, because they seem to be looking for patients. I don't know if uh, sites outside the US can, can join. But they look into clinical outcomes and patient reported outcomes. And uh, they have several outcomes reported here about disease activity, as well as um, function, fatigue, pain, and morning stiffness. And when I look at their publications, the core Evitas uh, was previously called the Corona Registry. And their publication started in 2003. And up to 2019, they have 76 pages, 75 pages of publication. So that's more than 700 publications about disease control, uh, looking at various outcomes, drug efficacy, and safety of drug combinations, different dose regimens, and duration of use. So a lot of data coming out of registries. 
So, well, in the Philippines, we, of course, also wanted to understand our patients with rheumatoid arthritis because uh, to serve them well, we have to understand them. And uh, Dr. Penserga, uh, together with the section of rheumatology in 2008, set up the rheumatoid arthritis database and registry. And uh, we, we were able to start it together with, with pharmaceutical support. And as of 2020, we have logged in around 480 cases. And it's been a stop and go. Uh, we are not, you know, we don't, we need funding for such an enterprise. We need uh, dedication. And uh, the dedication was not lacking, but the funding was sometimes lacking. So we, Mom Pen started it by asking us to formulate research questions about patient characteristics, treatment modalities, different outcomes that we, we looked at, no, disease control, the adverse effects of treatment, infections, and cardiovascular health. And I could still remember the hours spent talking about the data that we wanted to include. Because even before uh, the radar, uh, there was already at least one publication uh, in the PJIM about our rheumatoid arthritis patients. And we looked at demographic characteristics. And um, if you look at this study by Dr. Abelia in 2000, which uh, studied patients from 1991 to 1994. So uh, I was a fellow at the time, no? And uh, compare it with the data collection from the radar, which was 2010 to 2012. Uh, there were a lot of patients included in both studies and both used the classification criteria in 1987. Well, most of the patients were females and very consistent that the mean age was in the 40s. And um, the duration of illness prior to the diagnosis is quite long, up to five years in the, uh, in the radar data. And um, we see that the duration of consultation prior to reaching a rheumatologist was around two years. Not many of our patients with smokers and their BMI uh, was quite near the normal. Okay, So obesity was not a big problem among our patients with rheumatoid arthritis. If we look at morning stiffness, uh, prolonged morning st stiffness of one hour or more in the two studies, not 100%. No? So uh, 60, 66%, 70% in the study of Dr. Penserga. But the hand joint involvement was really very much. And three or more joints involved is more than 96%. And um, I think this is important to note that some of the patients had a monoarticular onset. So in the study of Abelia, that occurred in 37%. And in the later study, that was 35%. So if you have a 55-year-old woman with pain at the knee, one knee or both knees, which usually is the picture we have of osteoarthritis, you know, you might diagnose that patient to have osteoarthritis. And when in fact, uh, she may have rheumatoid arthritis. And I have seen a few patients like those in the clinic, they've had, they've been treated as OA for two, three years, some even five years, and um, they're not improving. So they look for a rheumatologist. And uh, of course, we have the benefit of hindsight. So we are able to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis in the patient. Uh, symmetry in joint involvement is quite high, but uh, rheumatoid factor positivity is uh, only about 70, 74% in the study of Abelia. 
and 61% in the study of Dr. Penserga. And in the early years, we did not have the anti-CCP antibody. And even in the 2014 publication, only 14 patients had the anti-CCP test then. And we know that in our population, extraarticular involvement was not very much. No? At most, 11%. And radiographic findings uh, were present in around 70%. In the study of Dr. Abelia, uh, the odds of having radiographic findings was five times more among those who were rheumatoid factor positive. But the same association was not demonstrated in the later study. And there were, uh, in the first study, the comorbidities were found only in 26%, but later on, there were more patients with comorbidities because hypertension pa lang was already found in 27%. So these are the clinical characteristics, and uh, I'm emphasizing this because uh, we really want everyone to be able to suspect rheumatoid arthritis. And we see here that uh, the, their morning stiffness might not be an hour, no? And that the onset may be monoarticular or oli or oligoarticular. It might not be symmetrical all the time. Their rheumatoid factor might be negative. And their x-ray uh, early on will probably not see much except some nonspecific soft tissue swelling. Okay, so how was treatment uh, given? And uh, so most of the patients were on steroids, uh, but methotrexate, uh, I'm now reporting, uh, this is uh, the radar studies, uh, one in 2014 by Dr. Penserga and a later one by Dr. Dehoras, which was published, published in 2018. And you see that methotrexate, is uh, given to the majority of patients, but relatively at a low dose of 8.6 milligrams per week. And a large proportion were on monotherapy. Um, in a few, uh, well, 36% were also given hydroxychloroquine, but very few were given biologic DMARDs, and most of them were tocilizumab, probably because this was the time when Tocilizumab was being introduced in the market. We see a relatively low proportion of patients given combination DMARDs, 30% in the 2014 study and 17% in the 2018 study. An unpublished study in 2019 by Dr. Hambaro looked at use of biologic DMARDs for rheumatic diseases in the PGH over a seven year period uh, with 59 cases with rheumatic diseases treated with biologic DMARDs, 34, about half of them with rheumatoid arthritis, and the most commonly used were tocilizumab, etanercept, and infliximab. And uh, except for tocilizumab, which was given the over 48 months, it was being given 75% of the time. The other drugs were not really given uh, as well, no? Okay, what treatment response uh, did we observe? So this is disease activity measured by the DAS-28. So I'm presenting here three studies, 2014, 2018, and 2020. Uh, the 2020 study was of a smaller sample size of 77 patients. One notable difference is the shorter time to initiation of DMARD. Uh, in the 2022 study, which was 1.7 years. So we're hoping that this signifies that patients were going to their doctors earlier. And um, uh, with regards to the use of methotrexate, well, the latter study in 2022 uh, publication really aimed to look at methotrexate monotherapy. That's why uh, all of the patients there had methotrexate. But you will see that oh, given the three studies, uh, methotrexate was predominant drug. And one very important information from this is that at the beginning, our patients have very high 
disease activity with the DAS 28 of 5, more than 5. So that's consistent for the three studies. And um, after follow-up, uh, the gist here is that uh, the patients still, most of the patients still have moderate disease activity. So if you look at the study of Dr. Penserga, uh, you see the DAS 28 of 4.59, 4.52, 4.45. So these are all, this all means that the patients after several months of treatment still have moderate disease activity. And the same was true for the study of Dr. Dehoras and Dr. Grace Penserga. In fact, in the study published just this year of 77 patients, inadequate response was seen in 61%. What about adverse effects of treatment? So this was reported by Dr. Dehoras looking at uh, patients uh, given mon methotrexate monotherapy or combination. She had 50 patients with adverse effects or toxicities and 144 patients without adverse effects. And the methotrexate dose Average was 8.75. So I mentioned relatively low, but uh, half of our patients uh, developed some form of hepatotoxicity, but it was reversible. And down the line, uh, other adverse effects are shown. And this toxicity rate is similar to published data. The risk factors were directly correlated with older age, disease duration, with the onset, with presence of osteoarthritis, which may signify a longer disease duration, the higher doses used and longer duration of use, as well as the presence of anemia. So for us clinicians, we may use uh, this knowledge to be more careful among the patients uh, who, who are under these categories. And uh, management was mainly by dose reduction, or even retention of the dose with closer monitoring, addition of other DMARDs and shifting to other DMARDs. But all the patients benefited from an increase in the folate dose. What about uh, disease knowledge? We know that uh, knowledge of the disease of the patients is very important. And uh, uh, if they know more about the disease, then we hope that they will be better able to, to care for themselves and that uh, they will have better outcomes. So in this cross-sectional study, we gave the patients, we gave 57 patients tests, nine multiple choice questions. And these were patients who have had longstanding RA, who have been following up in our arthritis clinic for around five years. And most of them, uh, as shown in the previous slides, also have moderate disease activity, but we're, we're really quite functioning well, class one or two functional status. And what did we uh, get? No? So we found from this study that physicians were still their usual source of knowledge about rheumatoid arthritis, and therefore, we must really exert good effort in educating them about RA. They had, most of them had mild functional disability and they were only able to, on the average, answer five of the nine questions that we gave them in that short quiz. They had good awareness of their diagnosis that it was rheumatoid arthritis and it was not communicable, but they had low awareness about the causes and the risk factors. Uh, they did not know that smoking was uh, contributory and that it should be stopped. They were also non aware of uh, non pharmacologic treatments that were available and that they need to self monitor for disease flares and that they, if they ex experience certain symptoms, that they must go to, to their doctor immediately. They were not aware that complications to the lungs may occur and to the heart, and that extra articular involvement may occur, and that disease monitoring by the physician is also very important, so they must go for follow-up. 
saying that there are several modes of treatment available and that this must be continued. These drugs must be continued. So we, well, maybe because we just have had a few patients, we did not see any relationship between knowledge score and these different factors, but we found that functional disability was related to their perception of overall health status. Now, what about in the pandemic? No, uh, how did the pandemic affect uh, our patients with rheumatoid arthritis? So this is already outside of the radar because this was an online survey in 2020 over a two-week period. We had 512 patients with SLE or RA. Only about 20% of the patients in this huge in this study had RA, and we look at the impact of event scale and the depression, anxiety, and stress scales. In essence, the psychological impact of COVID-19 was at least moderate in 20%, and the impact score was higher among lupus patients than rheumatoid arthritis, but there was moderate to severe stress, anxiety, and depression in our patients. And we were able to identify risk factors for adverse mental health as being as those having comorbidity of hypertension and asthma, being a healthcare worker and symptoms of myalgia, cough, breathing difficulties, dizziness, and sore throat. And there were also protective factors for mental health, like satisfaction with available health information, as well as being able to wear face masks uh, all the time. In the same, um, in the same survey, we found that during the, the two-month quarantine period in 2020, only around 33% of our patients were able to reach their physicians. And of course, to someone who, is, uh, who has chronic illness, then that can also be quite distressing. And uh, although 82% of them were prescribed hydroxychloroquine and 23% were given methotrexate, a large proportion were not able to take their medicines regularly because they ran out. The supplies ran out. Um, overall, the patients said they had good current health status despite that, 66%. And... Um, 24% were asymptomatic during the two weeks prior to the illness, but many of them had symptoms of joint pains, muscle pains, headaches, rash, and there was positive association of these symptoms with the irregular supply of their medicines. The majority reported at least one symptom that may indicate a disease flare. Of course, we could not establish that this was indeed a disease flare because this was just a survey, survey, but there was significant association between irregular supply of their drugs with the symptoms that they had. So from all of these studies that we had uh, from before the radar, when we had the radar and outside of the radar during the pandemic, what do we know? We know that our patients with rheumatoid arthritis, most of them get to be diagnosed uh, later on, no? so it's delayed. And uh, only around 70% are rheumatoid factors seropositive. A high proportion of patients, despite our best efforts, remain to be in moderate disease activity after treatment, and many of them are at moderate to high disease activity at onset of the disease. Most of our patients are on methotrexate monotherapy, mainly because um, of access, affordability of other medicines. Uh, there is poor adherence to treatment and that we know that toxicity risk to methotrexate is increased in those who are older, given higher doses for longer periods of time those who have had longer disease, and those who are anemic. So there are a lot of things that we still need to know. We would like to be able to establish uh, how many of our patients really are positive for ACPA because this is a poor prognostic factor. 
we want to know a uh, response to combination therapy, including the new drugs that are available. We'd also like to know other outcomes, their quality of life, infection, cardiovascular disease, because we know that chronic infection is associated with increase in cardiovascular disease. So we'd like to be able to see that uh, data in our patients as well. And we'd also want to know whether tapering or reduction in doses can work for patients who are in remission. So how do we move forward to improve our patient's condition? Um, from my end, I think we must do a better job in educating the public for earlier diagnosis. And we must continue to educate our patients, maybe look for better ways to educate them. Maybe we're not doing it right. You know, a score of five in a nine point quiz is something that must be improved on. And uh, we need to standardize treatment protocols and monitor, monitor adherence better. Um, there are efforts now in the society level to look at uh, CPG and maybe in PGH, we can see how we can further adapt uh, the, the treatment strategies in the CPG and a comprehensive checklist of assessments during follow-up in the PGH arthritis clinic may help. But definitely we need to collect data. We need to continue with radar, explore other ways to collect data. And um, last but not the least, we need to advocate for our patients by uh, studying and networking because we cannot do this on our own. Uh, I found this, these five strategies for patient education success. And I know we know this already. All that we need to do is really apply them. No? We use, take advantage of technology that is available. We stimulate our patients' interest and know them. What is their learning style? Uh, I realize sometimes I explain so much, but not all patients want to hear explanations. There are different needs of patients. Some patients cannot understand you, no? So um, even if we explain so much, they have cognitive issues, they have mental health issues, they cannot understand. So we need to find a language that is easily understandable and definitely including the family in healthcare management is very important, but is easier said and done because we still have a lot of patients who come to the clinic on their own without um, family support, no? Although in the Philippines, it is a common scenario that we have the barangay with them, no? The family with them, but there are some patients who don't. So I, I'd like to end this, uh, this lecture or this report by expressing my sincere thanks to the consultants of the Division of Rheumatology, to our fellows from 2008 to 2020 who took part in collection, data collection, and our current fellows who are also doing a data collection about rheumatoid arthritis. The radar study group was headed by Dr. Penserga, uh, uh, and I've listed here all the people who have collected data, who have published their data. And uh, I, if I missed out anyone, I'm sorry. Sisisihin natin si Mompen because she gave me the... Uh, these names, okay, nadamay pa. Uh, also, uh, the authors included in the COVID studies, and uh, I'd like to, th to thank Dr. Barte for fixing up my slides. So that's my last slide. Uh, I hope I did not. Oh my gosh, it's 9.59. Yes, uh, you are. That was a yes, long monologue. Thank you for your attention. Oh, 
Thank you very much, Evelyn and Dr. Salido, for that very comprehensive lecture. Indeed, it was comprehensive in the sense that you went through the past and then the current, a lot of the current, and then uh, what we have to face uh, for the future. But we have questions we need to, I'll ask Dr. Jan Anyonuevo for some, a little more time. Dr. De La Vega, I co-choral anniversarian. How do we deal with a very old patient with severely deformed rheumatoid arthritis joints but without swelling or pain? What are the extra articular complications to look for? Thank you, uh, classmate uh, Shelly, uh, for, for asking this, uh, this question. We individualize our patients and uh, if they are not in pain and their problem is more of function, then we address that, uh, especially since the older patients are more prone to develop adverse effects of uh, medications. Then we usually we give very low doses of medications and uh, we emphasize all, all the measures that we can assist them with in improving muscle strength, preventing falls, uh, making sure that they have enough calcium and vitamin D because osteoporosis is a condition that they also have. Um, so we, we tailor to their needs. If they don't have pain, then we don't need to give them uh, the medicines. Uh, but I think it will be worthwhile also checking the acute phase reactance because some patients may not express pain because they have other concerns. And if the acute phase reactance are elevated and if there are no other reasons for it, then we might also need to give very low doses of disease-modifying drugs like hydroxychloroquine. Um, it, it may work for our patients. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. And here's uh, one comment of uh, Dr. Hazel Reyes. Congr uh, she's congratulating you uh, comprehend on a comprehensive review of locally relevant literature. Um, if I may add, moving forward, it may be helpful for the patients if we also improve engagements with our colleagues and work toward improving access to, an, to accessible health care. I think, Evelyn, you, you have a comment for this. Yes. <laughs> well, um, our efforts towards that are uh, really, you know, we're really working on uh, engagement. So some little things that we've been doing is like uh, putting our thoughts in and coming up with a toolkit, which we published as the physician's guide to uh, teleconsultation. We are also engaging with, um, with the Department of Health and uh, submitting articles about uh, different kinds of arthritis in their Healthy Filipinas website. So you may watch out for this. So these are for our patients. We are also, of course, actively engaged with the Philippine Rheumatology Association in uh, trying to further the advocacies for our patients. And I know that the PRA is also working very hard to come up with the CPG and engage DOH and PhilHealth so that our medications will be available. No, the, the, the expensive medications uh, I was talking about will be more available to the patients through uh, PhilHealth packages. And of course, universal healthcare is here. It's an opportunity for us to uh, improve access for our patients. Yes, uh, let me also that's... mention, of course, that yeah. we are also, of course, uh, actively engaging with uh, the pharmaceutical industry who, who are um, producing these drugs. Yes, okay. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, extended no? because, uh, explanation because uh, in truth, uh, one, one of the problems really was on 
is on how to bring medicines to our patients. So hopefully our field health interaction, uh, in engagement with field health will have some fruits in soon. Uh, we have one more very important uh, uh, question from a very important person, of course, Dr. Jan Anyanuevo. He's asking whether we have any genetic testing done for RA. Um, hmm. Di ko yata alam yan. Um, <laughs> we have, well, there are HLAs that, that may be done. No, um, I, I think your question may, might be, I am just guessing that it may, might be for patients who may be in the, who have family members with RA and uh, who might want to be tested or maybe for difficult to diagnose patients uh, with some symptoms of RA. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe ma'am, you, you have it. Uh, I know that Dr. T um, yeah. submitted a, a protocol to PCHRD, but uh, because exactly because we want to do genetic testing for rheumatoid arthritis, but I think we are still waiting for the results of that funding or maybe resubmit the protocol. Uh, but for everyday use, uh, I don't really know if we have it. Meron po ba, ma'am? Wala. Uh, wala din, no? So for everyday use or for diagnostics as we, Evelyn has already very uh, well explained it. It's really diagnosis is by criteria, clinical criteria. But true, uh, we probably should look into our uh, genetics, uh, Dr. Anion Revo also. No? So we are looking at that funding that uh, uh, I think Dr. T has done one for SLE. Uh, but we need also to have our... Uh, characterization of uh, the ge ge genetic makeup of our RA patients. <clears throat> let Thank me you, also John. add, yeah, let me also add that there's a lot of discussion online on uh, that pre-RA thing and uh, family members mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, um, family members of patients with RA, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was able to come across several publications and it's an issue where they want to know or not know. Uh, and that uh, there were some patients who were really not ready. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to get tested. So it's, uh, it's something that it's a right. Um, because hindi nga din natin alam, no? If, even if they have that gene, if uh, but so it's it's a huge discussion out there. It's interesting. Yeah, I think uh, in addition there could be um, targeted genetic therapy in the future. We 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 might also venture on uh, waiting for those uh, for those means no to uh, identify gene genetic mutations that can be tweaked. Uh, for treatment purposes. I think uh, we have, in fact, no more questions in our boxes and we have gone through. Dr. Salido, very, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very excellent dis discourse on uh, the local experience we have on rheumatoid arthritis and showing that, uh, showing our community that in fact we are trying to know our rheumatoid arthritis patients as much as we can, and that we have programs for them from educational materials to getting our data uh, through big data. No? The radar was a dream on big data. However, again, uh, therefore, uh, this community knows now that we do have needs for funding also. And we are looking also at early diagnosis. Those are very simple items to look for, like just uh, the ability to make a fist, uh, a, a uh, relative with the rheumatoid, with the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, etc. So that we are able 
for all clinicians no? so that all clinicians may be able to identify a duck when it quacks, so to speak. So, uh, Dr. Salido, I will, and uh, for our uh, for our audience, we are going to um, end this uh, uh, professorial chair lecture and a round of congratulations, Evelyn, and to your team. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. for Sana, servisyong kapatang